Welcome to Sorghum Smart Talk, a new podcast brought to you through a partnership of national sorghum producers and the Sorghum Checkoff. I'm John Duff, NSB Strategic Business Director, coming to you from Lubbock, Texas, capital city of the great American desert. In 1820, American explorer Stephen Long wrote that the area was wholly uninhabitable for those depending upon agriculture for their subsistence. And yet here we are, almost 200 years later, not only surviving, but thriving. There's not a doubt in my mind that this is due to the ingenuity of our farmers and drought-hardy crops like sorghum. Times are tough on the farm right now. Margins are as tight as they've been since the 1980s, and Commodity markets are some of the most volatile in history. Uh, for that reason, we started Sorghum Smart Talk to uh, give producers the tools that they need not only to survive, but to thrive for the next 200 years. We're going to kick off with a series on marketing. and We're going to dive deep on a number of topics in this series. Futures, options, cash marketing, crop insurance positions, storage, and I may even throw in some probability theory from time to time. I can't guarantee that you'll be a better marketer by the time this series is over, but I can guarantee that you will know more about active marketing and risk management. We're going to bring in several folks during the course of this series, but our first guest will be John Miller. John started Southwest Agribusiness Consulting in 1999 to provide personalized price risk management strategies for South Plains agriculture. John, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. So tell us a little more about your business, John. I know you started in 1999. Um, tell us about your business, the clients you serve, and kind of the, the geographies that you serve. Sure. And thanks, John. And thanks all that you and NSP and Checkoff do to keep us and our customers in step with the constantly changing nature of our business. Um, I think it's just information is so important, and it's, it's very powerful in our, our type of work. Uh, but from the beginning... Uh, Our approach has has been to bring focused price risk management to the farmer uh, and down at the farm level. So many times we hear farmers talk about the complications of the marketplace, uh, so many writings and approaches that go over their heads. We really try to make our program individualized, uh, not a one size fits all. It's it's very basic in nature, kind of a, a keep it simple concept in that we use cost of production as our basic building block. And then we strive to help farmers execute price floors in a very disciplined and organized way that protects their profits, but also maintains the upside. So in addition to cash marketing, we also try to employ other tools available to farmers, such as futures and options through a commodity account to manage risk. And you may ask, well, why do we advertise ourselves as as consultants versus say a a merchandiser or or a broker is a common term. And that's because the way we charge and the way we maintain relationships, it's much more than a merchandiser or a broker. It's a consultant. And that relationship helps us communicate in a way that develops trust, which allows us to uh, uh, be better informed and keep our clients better informed about the potential outcomes based on their localized individual situation. So what commodities do you specialize in? And I know you mentioned futures and options a little bit, but what, what are the most common instruments uh, that, that your producers are using? Right. Well, I found out from the beginning also that you really need to go from a whole farm approach. And there are tremendous specialists that we even we utilize that may work on, on just sorghum or just corn or or cotton, for example, or or cattle, obviously, um, in your country out there in the panhandle. But we found that to to use a trade account effectively, uh, to look at competing dollars on the farm, um, that we really have to take a whole farm approach to risk management. And so that's sort of what has led us into working with all the grain crops, cotton, cattle, and even inputs in some cases. For example, we do a fair amount of hedging and fuel not only uh, farm fuel such as diesel, but also irrigation fuel in the form of natural gas. Um, but it really what, what I guess develops our personality on the South Plains is the extreme uh, weather that we face. And so where some areas of the country may be able to use, uh, say, country elevator generated products uh, in their cash contracts, we end up using a lot of options in our country because, again, committing those bushels 
much in advance at harvest can be a very difficult, sometimes if not emotional experience for a farmer, because most of them have experienced in their lifetime, maybe maybe several times, to where only contracting a small amount led to a real worrisome time period during the growing season with the potential of facing buyouts of contracts and those sorts of things. But fortunately, uh, options products, which were developed for the farmer and really kicked into high gear in the 1970s, um, allow a, a safe way that a farmer can risk a, a known premium, you know, something that farmers and, and their families and their bankers especially like to hear is that you're, you're putting up a known risk, a known premium to participate in the marketplace. So uh, I, I know you, you, you hit on a topic a second ago that I want to expand on a little bit, uh, specifically goal setting. Uh, you mentioned uh, you start with the crop budget, start with profitability analysis, but uh, dive a little deeper on the goals that your customers have and uh, the goals that you have for your customers. Right. Well, I think, again, so many things in life are, are personality-driven or driven by our experiences. And, you know, different farm operations, different farm families may choose to work with a, a variety of consultants or maybe no consultants. It, I guess it depends on, again, what skills you bring to the table and what time you want to afford outside your normal production activities. But I think the way that we get incorporated into an operation is simply that those families want to be better at what they do, uh, particularly in the, in the price risk management arena. Um, so again, we become part of a larger marketing team that may include you know, equipment consultants or technology, crop technology consultants or, you know, regulatory, you know, banking. Uh, uh, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of resources available out there and experts in the field. The bottom line is, is the farmer wears a lot of hats every single day. In fact, when I'm in a pickup or, or on a tractor or in an office uh, with some of our customers, I'm amazed just in a one or two hour span of time during the day how many different specialists that they talk to over the phone or texting or emailing uh, to simply grow a crop. And I say simply, you know, in a, in a loose way, you know, it's become a very complex, highly capitalized business. Um, as far as, as set pack goals and risk management, I know a lot of firms advertise, well, we're gonna keep you in the top third of the market or the quarter of the market. And, and there's nothing wrong with that concept. I mean, obviously the being in the top third of the market year in, year out would be a great place to be, you know, and it's something that you strive for. But I don't think that's something that we get focused on because we don't want to just be telling a farmer what they want to hear, or we don't want to be going after a certain level and lose sight of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of protecting profits or maintaining upside in the crop. So I like to think, I like the word sustainability because to me, sustainability tells me, you know what? I'm, I'm farming right now. Maybe I'm farming where my grandfather and my father did, or maybe I built this and I have children in, in this. Maybe I have grandchildren now. And when I think of sustainability, I like to think about the customers of ours that, that I expect to be with 20 years from now, or I expect my other staff to be with uh, a generation from now. So I really like the overall goal of financial uh, sustainability. And so that's our focus. And, but again, if I just had to pick a number, um, I would love to be in the top third of the market year in, year out. And, you know, a lot of years, the uh, incremental selling and the, uh, you know, even the modest use of, of, of a trade account with futures and options can keep you in that sort of position. But as you know, uh, living in the arid uh, high plains, uh, there's no guarantees year to year with the crop uh, or with the marketplace. So uh, one of our goals with this series uh, is, is timely delivery of, of messages that, that are designed to help farmers when they need them most. Uh, with the sorghum industry and 25% of our crop produced south of San Antonio uh, and thus harvested already in June, it's, it's not always easy to do that. Uh, and for farmers in particular hearing uh, this episode for the first time, uh, they're they're looking to go to the field right now, or they may already be in the field, or if they're in South Texas, they've already caught. So uh, with that in mind, and with not a whole lot of time left in the marketing year to, to really jump in and be aggressive with marketing, talk a little bit about what farmers that want to jump in today can do to optimize their cash grain sales or, or make the best of what they've got 
uh, opportunities they've got uh, today for the next couple of months of the growing season. I'm glad you brought that up um, because it's true. The South Texas versus the high plain sorghum crop require completely a different approaches. They have vastly different cropping timelines, as you as you point out. In fact, I think that's one of the most interesting things about Texas, you know, and in, in, in our state's reach from south to north, uh, and the way that happens each year. In fact, I can't tell you how many times I've been talking to someone in, you know, Kansas City or much less, uh, you know, up in Iowa or South Dakota, and it'll be the last week of January. And they ask me what I'm, you know, what I'm doing. And I'm saying, well, I've been talking to customers that are planting corn or sorghum in the Rio Grande Valley. And they're just amazed. They're like, you're kidding me. Where somebody's planting a crop somewhere. And the same thing happens in, you know, in late May, I'll be talking to some of these same people and they've forgotten about me since then. And they'll ask me how the season's going. I'm saying, well, we're harvesting, you know, harvesting sorghum down in South Texas this week. And they're like, are you kidding me? No one harvests, harvests sorghum in the middle of May. So, um, and yet, uh, gosh, uh, in the middle of May, when sometimes the valley is harvesting sorghum, uh, your country in the, in the Texas High Plains is not even planted yet, right? So uh, it brings up an interesting uh, a thought about how you approach marketing in that way. For example, in South Texas, it's not uncommon uh, for those farmers to be selling a conservative amount or definitely buying options uh, um, on the futures market during that February to May time frame when they've already planting and they're going through the main part of the, of the growing season of the crop. Whereas in the high plains, you know, they may not even have decided what they're going to put on a lot of, a lot of dry land acres at that point, you know, uh, whether it's going to be cotton or, or sorghum um, and what weather do they expect that might affect their first planting or maybe their second planting or maybe their third planting, uh, you know, before July. So, uh, so I think that, that that's an important, really important for sorghum because in South Texas, the main push on the basis is generally just post harvest in the Cor Corpus Christi area, say, say end of July, early August, uh, out through say mid October to mid November. Whereas, uh, in your area, maybe they're waiting on a freeze to kill that dry land crop and, uh, they're not even harvesting until November in many cases. So the South Texas farmer, in many, many years would have completed their selling uh, selling program and not have any crop left to sell uh, before the, the High Plains farmer is even harvesting. Um, now, of course, South Texas is driven by the Gulf Coast and the basis of, from foreign buyers uh, out of Houston or Corpus, or maybe by truck crops to some degree, uh, say ports like Progreso um, or Laredo. And so that basis, again, tends to peak in the fall when border, I guess I'll call them border cash traders or border merchandisers are trying to garner supplies to maintain an active truck market throughout the fall and winter for their customers just south of the border. In the High Plains, you have a very different dynamic where you have the addition of, of, of sorghum supplying cattle, in some cases hogs, and, and obviously the ethanol markets in southern Kansas. And so that's a whole different basis dynamic. For example, now, uh, uh, the sorghum basis at the Houston and, and the Port of Corpus is probably running in the in the 40 to 60 over December corn futures range, whereas in the High Plains, the basis is much better than the freight spread at this time. You know, probably in the minus 20 to minus 40 range across the entire South Plains. So again, it's that tug of those domestic markets that change the situation in the High Plains. Um, so. Understandably, however, with the low futures market, due to perhaps the large Midwest corn crop coming off and the, the estimation of a 181 per acre national average corn yield and a 52 bushel per acre or perhaps higher national average soybean yield uh, would perhaps keep futures markets down in the near future. Um, and if that's the case, I'm not really that... Um, scared say, I guess scared's a crazy word, but I, I guess I'm not that worried about the High Plains farmer, you know, maybe ha purchasing put options on the futures market, testing for higher futures. And then the fact that you do have a, a domestic milo market in, in many locations in the High Plains, that could encourage a farmer to maybe store a while while we let some of this uh, tariff discussion abate and perhaps correct prices at the Gulf. 
So the bottom line is where the South Texan is probably through marketing their cash sorghum, they're looking at purchasing call options in the spring to minimum price that sorghum. The High Plains farmer may be just getting started where they're looking for rallies like we've seen the last three or four days to buy options or hedge that crop and then wait for basis gains into the first of the year, particularly if they can defer income. So uh, you, you provided a great segue there um, uh, into storage. And I want to jump back to basis uh, in a second. But first, I want to have you expand on storage a little more. Uh, it's, it's common in some parts of the country, and it's uncommon in others. But you have quite a few farmers that, uh, that, that do a lot of storage on the farm. So uh, what is your advice to those producers who have storage today on, on how to best take advantage of those with current market conditions? Sure. Um, and storage, you know, is a very individual decision. I mean, we have have certain farmers of certain sizes and land tenures and in certain markets where storage seems pretty obvious to them. And then people not far down the road that maybe a, a storage isn't a, a, the best fit for their family. So it's a very individualized decision to have storage. But what I can say with confidence is that every customer we have with storage, that it has paid off for them and it's not something that they've ever regretted. And so, it, um, because the reason is time is really the farmer's friend in many cases. It slows things down. And so you're not pressured into trying to capture a particular futures market. You have time to test for rallies or maybe improvements in the spread uh, between futures, say between December and March, for example. And most importantly, you have time, uh, particularly when you're able to hedge your crop at desirable levels, to test for better basis market. So again, time can be can be the farmer's friend. But uh, if maintaining the, the crop condition and delaying cash flow are an option, um, you know, storage just simply extends that opportunity to capitalize on increases in the board and the basis. And so you'll be watching um, uh, spring and summer corn futures, just like we discussed uh, previously, uh, for opportunities to hedge in the spring and early summer uh, which the last four or five years have, have shown that's been the best time to uh, capitalize on the futures market. Um, but then uh, the big part of the game starts post-harvest where you start managing basis. And um, again, I've found in South Texas and even in the High Plains that you can, you can hold out for profitable basis gains the vast majority of the years. Um, and what we've seen, you know, and again, we're all very familiar with the Gulf and the, the basis reports that we, we provide through NSP, um, that the port has very dramatic changes in basis. But you'd be surprised, even in the high plains um, of Texas and, and, and elsewhere, Kansas, et cetera, um, you can see basis opportunity. Now, they may not be something that's necessarily published to a wide degree, but there's always cattle, hog, and ethanol users, and, and others, specialty industrial products that are always scanning scanning the horizon, looking for uh, marketable quantities of sorghum um, to try to make a deal on. So uh, I would say that, again, if, if, if the extra labor to store the crop, maintaining the quality, if that's a, a very ordinary thing for you, and you have the ability to spread out your income over a longer period of time, I really just have not seen a market, particularly uh, across the South Plains, to where uh, that can't be an advantage. So uh, you, you brought up basis again, and I want to I want to talk about that a little more, um, and, and specifically related to the current basis situation. It's uh, it's always uh, almost impossible to predict basis moves. And so one thing we found is um, looking back at history uh, is helpful and um, specifically looking at whether a, a, a given basis level is good relative to history. And if you have a really good basis opportunity, sometimes it just pays to take that. Um, so specifically with regard to this harvest, uh, what do you feel like those those probabilities are in that history looks as far as as far as lining up for this harvest? Yes. You know, again, like storage, basis is all about time. You know, what time do I have to test for a better basis market? And secondly, it's about having an exit strategy. Um, 
you try, again, you try to focus on cost of production, you try to focus on profits, and you try to focus on returns to storage. And those are all things that we help our customers deal with, you know, every, every basically every business day that we that we have. And so um, I think that that a lot of times, you know, farmers will understand enough about bases uh, to to feel like they can, uh, I guess, control it to some degree. And the thing is, is that just like the futures market, um, it can be extremely volatile. And say if you have a, a given number in mind, how many times have we been one or two cents short of that given number and not given in and missed out on a great opportunity? And and again, you can you can talk to merchandisers and you can talk to uh, other professionals that deal in in basis daily, and they're going to have great opinions and and a lot of experience. But what I've found in my 20 years of experience is that just like the futures market, in the end, no one really knows where that's going to go. And of course, the current environment, uh, we've seen accelerated uncertainty about the basis, given all of the the back and forth with uh, uh, trade negotiations, whether we're updating NAFTA or or trying to uh, uh, you know update our, our our treaties, trade treaties with China, et cetera. And so. Um, We've moved much far beyond uh, the normal agitation and basis during the fall. But as far as the the, the, cur the current state of sorghum basis and coupled with all these supply and political factors going on, I would say that the, the next 60 to 90 days will be pretty challenging for the basis trader. That I would hope the farmer is hedged or maybe, for example, this recent corn futures rally uh, where December corns bottomed out at 343, now we're sitting on about 363. You know, maybe we use that time to um, establish some floors on the future side, and then test for higher basis levels, which in my mind is probably going to take into early next year to really provide desirable or interesting opportunities in the farmers in the farmers' mind. But I'm not really scared of that, particularly for the person uh, willing to hedge. But now. Remember, you're trying to outrun not only storage costs, but the cost of caring for the crop and the interest cost. So you need to understand those aspects of your storage. And a lot of people um, tend to forget to charge themselves. Uh, if I can go off on a story just a minute, I remember a, a neighbor growing up, and I, of course I was getting into college at A&M and thought I was getting really smart, you know, over time, and and so. I would start challenging him about his cattle and 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 what it cost to to care for those cattle and and talk to him about selling. And so he would tell me that, well, that's a ready source of cash, and he always made money on cattle. Well, I started listing off uh, you know all the the veterinary cost and the death loss and all these different things you learn about and start learning about in college. And he told me, he said, well, now, if you start adding all that up, you know, maybe I don't make money on them, you know. <laughs> so, so again, you can't forget to charge yourself, uh, not only for your cost, obviously, but for your, for your own time. And so you need to set realistic goals and basis, just like you would set realistic goals with futures or entry and exit points with, with options uh, or whether you're selling a piece of equipment. You know, you have to have realistic goals and uh, understand that, that when you reach those goals, you, you should do something. So as long as the under, under, farmer understands that there's no guarantees about bases, just because, uh, say, say John Miller sends you a chart that shows uh, for the last 25 years bases might have behaved in this fashion, doesn't mean that it's going to behave in that fashion. And so, uh, um, but again, in, it is a generalization. I would say the next 60 to 90 days, given what we know about the, the tariff uh, negotiations with, with Mexico, China, et cetera, um, and what we know about the size of the Midwest crop and the fact that futures markets could likely struggle, uh, it'll be kind of a tough time period for us. But post-harvest uh, Midwest and then getting past the end of the year on basis, uh, I'm, I'm not real concerned about that. I, I wouldn't be afraid to, to um, work with that situation. So uh, I, I want to wrap up by talking about kind of the bigger macro picture and interest rates would be one of them. But uh, before I do that, uh, talk a little bit more about the global supply and demand situation uh, for, for both feed grains and protein that, that are driving some of the, the bigger picture world uh, balance sheet issues. Right. And right now I think 
so much of what's going on in the world with supply and demand relates to the, to the simple idea of big crops and big demand. And so we've seen now, really since 2013, and I think particularly where you are in the, in the High Plains, uh, you can vividly remember 2011 and 2012 and the extremity of the drought in that area. In fact, I remember a customer commenting at, that, at the end of 2012 when I asked him, you know, how that crop ranked. And he said, well, it'd be the worst crop of my life if it weren't for last year. And so, so again, uh, we know what that's like. And of course, during that same time period, 2008 through 2012, we had other drought conditions going on in, in Australia and, and in uh, Russia and in Africa and, and in as close to places as Canada on their wheat. Since 2013, however, we've had pretty good, I guess what I'd call continental crops around the world. We just haven't had big overarching drought problems, much less a multi-continent situation like we had during the commodity booms in 08 to 2012. And so um, with that though, we've seen USDA continue to increase uh, forecasts on domestic demand for, for grains and uh, also on international demands for grains. The continued rise in both world population and in incomes, you know, and in um, uh, support for low-income individuals by governments around the world, one has to be pretty optimistic about agriculture going forward, particularly in the in the food grains. Uh, you know, you only have to cite an example of China. You know, prior to 20 years ago, the charts are almost, you know, down at the at the at the, at the bottom of the of the, of the margin. Uh, as far as what they used to purchase uh, in world trade. And now they're routinely purchasing over 75% of the soybeans that move around the world. And so that's just in the last 20 to 25 years that we've seen that. And of course, sorghum has been a, a huge player of that, a, a, probably the starkest illustration you could find in crop agriculture uh, as far as the, the Chinese purchase of U.S. sorghum since 2013. And so we're, we're acutely aware of the big crop, big demand, uh, scenarios that we're that we're seeing, and so um, uh, it's really uncommon to find a, a to find a merchandiser that deals in the international markets daily that doesn't have a friendly long-term out, outlook for feed grains and for proteins. So that's a uh, that's a great way to bridge into the wrap up. Other macro factors, uh, we've talked a lot about um, interest rates, uh, exchange rates, global financial crisis effects on commodity markets. Uh, talk a little bit of about. Uh, what farmers should be looking at when it comes to those macro uh, macro factors. Right. Um, it's kind of interesting, but prior to the to 2008 to 2010 global financial crisis, uh, which all of a sudden made us all watchers of commodities we never, you know, never thought of. Um, uh, I remember having a, a corn chart and a cotton chart and a wheat chart and maybe crude oil you know, during the day to, to have discussions with customers and make decisions about hedging. It seemed we, we pretty much kept up with U.S. and world supply demand numbers and, and obviously had the weather charts going. But during that uh, financial crisis, we all just became critically aware of how important currency values are to our business. You know, we, all, we started seeing a, a collapse or near collapse of some of the country's largest financial institutions. Uh, of course, the Lehman situation and, and, and the failure of large banks or the close failure of large banks, the bailout. Um, and what was interesting at the time, it seemed like no, how much, no matter how much uncertainty was injected into our financial markets and how much we tried to, I guess, question what our government and large banking institutions were doing, the dollar started trading stronger against other currencies. Well, what that tended to dig out was how deep the financial crisis were uh, across Europe. And so uh, we were all taught how that, you know, probably a third of, of, uh, of our banking in the United States was directly tied, you know, to deposits and lending uh, in the European arena. And it really showed how that the United States could be drugged down uh, by financial crisis elsewhere in the world, particularly Europe at the time. Uh, not before long, we had Latin American countries, even some Asian countries pulled into that. And so it was just a matter of time before foreign buyers of our products, even of sorghum, um, started to show kinks in their ability to afford our sorghum or other commodities based on the currency rates. Um, uh, 
you know, one, one, a couple of examples. One example in currencies has been the Brazilian real over the past two years. Uh, one would uh, think that based on our lower futures market and our, our good lending practices, uh, we stand by our contracts, our great logistics, uh, that it would encourage more soybeans uh, to be sold out of the United States. Well, as the Brazilian real has fallen against the dollar, based on various uh, uh, corruption uh, that, that has been exposed in, in, in Brazil, and also just the declining performance of their, of their economy, largely tied to falling oil prices, that that would be a, 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 an advantage for us. Well, what happened? The falling real has been a boon for South American soybean farmers, made their soybeans more competitive on the world market, and led to the, a faster expansion of soybean acres than one might think otherwise. Closer to home, I think about uh, trading sorghum on the Texas border with Mexico during harvest. So in that late May until, say, mid-July time period, where we're daily you know, working with uh, merchandisers on the U.S. side or maybe merchandisers that operate on both sides of the border, and we can see where one day there's an active participation and, and, and market for grain sorghum, and maybe come back the next day or particularly across the weekend on a Monday, and it's absolutely silent because of a cha abrupt change in the, in the peso against the dollar. And so, you know, and if that happens to hit the right person at the right time, that can have a big effect on their harvest, their decision making, and maybe even their incomes. So understanding currency, understanding that that's, a, um, that's an important factor, particularly when you're growing a commodity like sorghum, where some years can see up to 90% of the crop ex exported, I think is a good understanding of your own business. Um, and we, again, we should add interest rates. Um, you know, if, if, if anyone listening was farming during the 1970s, you know, I think that even, even the mention of the, the term 1970s probably sends shivers up their spines. You know, we saw what, uh, probably 25% interest rates on credit cards and, you know, probably 15 to 20% on some operating notes or land notes. And so we know that if that, if we were returned to something like that, that it would be crushing uh, in this current cost price squeeze that we're experiencing due to lower commodity prices um, that have not been accompanied by falling, uh, correspondingly falling input prices. So again, a return to double digit in interest rates would be ex extremely painful uh, given the current tight margins. So I definitely think that's something to keep an eye on. And there are ways actually, it gets a little complicated and a little bit more involved in setting up those types of accounts, but there are actually ways to hedge interest rates. And if it's not something you can do on your own, I would challenge you to ask your lender about it because many lenders uh, have programs where you can hedge interest rates multiple years. Well, uh, that's that's all I have here, John. Um, but that is a depressing way to end talking about 1980s interest rates. So, uh, <laughs> wrap, wrap us up with some thoughts. Uh, wrap us up with some overall thoughts on. Uh, uh, on the market, and uh, let's try to end on a positive note. Sure, and I, and I think that's easy to do because you know as we've seen since since particularly since 2007, uh, the advent of the ethanol program, um, the uh, advent of of greater logistical capabilities worldwide with 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 our rail systems and our shipping systems, computerization of all these systems, real time delivery of cotton, for example, to markets hundreds or thousands of miles away, almost real-time delivery of sorghum, whether in shipping or even in some cases containers around the world. And so, you know, particularly for the, for the young people, you know, looking longer term, agriculture is just super positive, particularly in the United States where we have a, a system of, of, of laws and uh, 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 property right protection, contract integrity, uh, lending integrity. And so I think young farmers in the United States and, and, and even those established farmers, you know, the next decade to me, even the next five years are very positive. Again, with growing populations, um, with uh, uh, rising incomes around the world, so many more people, and we're talking the tune of billions, you know, that have got a greater taste for, you know, more protein and improved food products. And I think sorghum has been on the cutting edge of that with research and development into new products, better feeding strategies. Uh, alongside of other other feed grains, but even in the in the ultra short term, you know, from now until next harvest, there's going to be volatility. You know, the 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 users of grains, 
uh, the speculative participants in the grain trade, you know, they understand that where prices are now is very, very affordable. And they also understand that we'll have to reach uh, higher, higher levels uh, in the futures market to encourage a stable, uh, stable supply or, or even a, a growth to meet again this environment of big crops and big demand. So I think the way that we end on positive a note is just understand that. You know, we live in a, a wonderful free country that protects our rights to do what we want to do every single day. And we can do that um, with an understanding that we're going to continue to get better at what we do in the field, better in what we do as, as a business. We have a tremendous support group, you know, whether it's associations like NSP or, or Checkoff or consultants like myself or other family members that come back in the operation that because the field seems exciting. And I, I can't tell you how many cases I've seen among our customers um, to where all these exciting things going on with equipment technology, seed technology, uh, whether it's farm storage or maybe it's, it's uh, learning to use futures markets, that that excitement alone has helped even you know young people with college educations come back to the farm to be a part of that excitement. So I'm very optimistic even short term, we'll see rallies in the futures market, we'll continue to see volatility in basis. But again, it's not something you can go to sleep on, right? I mean, it's something that you have to pay attention to. But I think farmers, um, you know, they've, 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 they've learned to be out front with phone technology and internet, uh, I mean, sorry, internet capabilities. This program alone, you know, supports that concept. Uh, you know, uh, getting information over email or, or download off YouTube. Um, so uh, I think there's, there's so much to be positive about. And I think what's going on now in terms of depressed prices, a flat line in basis, a, a lot of the, the, um, I guess, uncertainty about, about where, where we're going in terms of our trade partners, but these are all temporary. And I think, I think most people understand that. So, so big crops, big demand, and time is your friend. And we have tools available to deal with that. Thanks for joining us, John. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I hope, hope we found this discussion helpful. John Miller, Southwest Agribusiness Consulting. Join us next time on Sorghum Smart Talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about accounting techniques and cost tracking for more educated marketing. In the meantime, uh, check us out on sorghumgrowers.com and sorghumcheckoff.com. Thanks for joining.